Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Rob. Rob, for everyone out there listening, would you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, Robbie. Thanks for inviting me to the show. My name is Rob Siemens. I'm a professor at the New York University's Stern School of Business. And what exactly do you focus in at the... I'm, I am i don't even think I can remember the name. I'm sorry about that. No worries. No worries. It's a Monday morning, right? And, uh, and, and we need our coffee. Um, yeah, I, I'm a professor at New York University. And I'm at the business school. The business school is called the Stern School of Business. Um, the particular area where I do research and teaching is competitive strategy, uh, particularly with an eye towards the use of technology in competitive strategy. So, I, so in terms of competitive strategy, what, what I mean is thinking about how firms interact with each other in terms of pricing or competing on quality or something like that, uh, or perhaps competing in terms of innovation and introducing you know, an innovative new product, uh, perhaps a product that uses AI uh, to enhance it or something like that. Well, before we get into the extents of what AI can do, have you noticed that the business kind of has changed since AI has been implemented? It seems like there's always these kind of stereotypes of like cutthroat business, of doing whatever you got to do to sell a product or get ahead or be above the competition. And I'm wondering if AI has really changed that or is it still kind of the same process just with a different form kind of added into it? Maybe it can be a hindrance and a help as well. So I know through my talks of technology, um, AI seems like it's going to be taking a lot of positions. I know there's a robotics company, I think it's called Miso Robotics. And they have like probably what we would see on like a movie where they have a uh, machine that can flip a burger. It's just an arm, but it can flip a burger and you can see what that could be implemented to it. And then it goes even farther. If we look at China, they have uh, different types of technologies that have like Android like robotics and with human-like skin. It's this type of nanotechnology incorporated onto it. So there's a lot of different aspects you can incorporate this to. And it seems like every company is trying to be the main producer, be the first one there, the first one in the market, because it's much like Google. Google captured all basically web engines. I mean, we know Yahoo and all that, but they're the dominant one we think of when we think of a web engine. And that's in part because they were the first ones that were just all over the place. Yeah, I mean, you've touched on a, a number of interesting and important topics. Um, you, you mentioned about uh, the, the robotic arm, right? Flip, flipping the burgers. So, so actually, a lot of the research that I've done has been on robotics in particular. And so, ha you know, we can maybe go into that at some point. But I want to come back to the very first thing that you mentioned, which was about, um, uh, a, you know, the, the effects that AI are going to have on firms is going to be um, multiple, right? I mean, it's we can't say, oh, it's it's going to be good or oh, it's going to be bad. It'll lead to a bunch of layoffs or something like that. Um, the reality is, a bunch of firms use AI in a bunch of different ways, um, and so it impacts firms on a whole bunch of different dimensions. Uh, to, to, just to give sort of a small flavor of this, we can think about the different ways in which AI affects us in our in our everyday life, right? So you and I are connecting via Zoom. There is some, some AI, or if you will, some advanced technology that's underlying our use of Zoom to make the sound quality um, you know, better and enhance and things like that. Um, when you and I were communicating via email the past few days to set up this time, um, I, I was able to take advantage of a handy predictive typing feature uh, that Google has in its, in its Gmail, right? So that, that, that's basically using AI to try to predict what words I'm going to use next. Um, perhaps you listen to Spotify or something like that. Spotify relies on AI to uh, suggest to you songs that you like based on patterns that it sees in other songs that you've listened to and liked in the past. Uh, right? I mean, so, so there's so many different ways in which AI already has been influencing our life. But many of these though, are fairly mundane and, and aren't really world changing. And I think that that's uh, really one of the big things that we're waiting for is 
um, something big to come out of this. And I and just give you one example of what this sort of big thing might be. I mean, it could be like autonomous driving or something like that, autonomous vehicles, which are a sort of a complicated collection of a bunch of different technologies. But for sure, there's AI, perhaps several different AIs that are being uh, used in autonomous vehicles to help make the vehicle sort of stay on the road and sort of react to things um, that come up on the road in real time. Um, but I, so, so, I, so I like to think about all the different ways in which AI is already affecting our lives, but then I also try to think, look, look to the future to what other bigger things we're going to be getting. Well, where would you like to see it go compared to where would you not like to see it go? Because autonomous vehicles scares me. Um, it's not really the aspect of technology and not having to drive your car, but it's the ability that that's going to be the only source of driving. Um, from talking to people with autonomous vehicles, they're like by 2050, when you get to level five autonomous vehicles or, you know, where that you won't need to have human driving anymore, it'll be illegal to human drive. Now that is a crazy severe scenario but i mean it's if i'm looking from a business aspect which you gotta have to really do in types of talks like this because i think a lot of people put their own personal experience like they'll never take away my driving um yeah but if every car is going by fully autonomous and you're the you're the odd man out you're the minority i would say then that's an issue because then we can't, we got to account for you messing up the other ways the, all these cars are programmed, but I'm hearing some amazing things with autonomous vehicles when it comes to predictive technologies, being able to predict human behavior, which, I mean, I don't know what information they're putting in there. I think everybody's a little bit like, I'm insane. If you can predict what I'm going to say next, and that's just, that's crazy. We got to get you like in a circus or a carnival to be able to guess someone's weight or something. But this is a, it's, this is a thing that's increasing. It's going to end up becoming the normal and i think it's much like what you were saying where we have all these things already spotify zoom at some level some very small maybe minuscule interaction there is ai involved into our lives and i go the way to work up to autonomous vehicles is by starting with something that doesn't interact with your actual driving experience and that starts with things like mail delivery things where there's a job and there is someone doing that but you necessarily don't i mean does anybody ever catch their mail like you sit at your mailbox and wait for your mail to get dropped off. Maybe you have an important package, but most of the time, a package is just there. You don't know if it was a person. You don't know who the person was. You don't know when their birthday is. So these are things where you could implement it. And then by the time you start rolling out fully autonomous vehicles for people to access, you people could have a problem. You're like, yeah, but your mail's delivered by it. The trains are driven by it. Mostly planes now are driven, are flown by it. So you get this aspect of like, oh, I guess I'm already using it. Much like your example, Spotify, Zoom, and all these other things. I didn't, I didn't know. I mean, I knew algorithms are a thing, but I mean, I guess the extent of AI is an umbrella term. We talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, that's anything from human interference computer systems or we're talking about things that go into weapon systems codings algorithms web searches all these types of things that really open up this area of data exploration that i think people are now starting to become more calm and normal to and i gave you a lot and i'm sorry oh don't be sorry i i, I love it i i, I want to start with the one of the first things that you said when we were talking about autonomous vehicles you used the term the, the year sorry 2050 now, what's interesting is if, if we were having this conversation five years ago, you might have instead have said not, you know, 2045, but you might have said 2022, um, you know, not that long ago, five years ago or so, four years, maybe, uh, there were a lot of people saying that, you know, within a few years, we're going to have autonomous vehicles everywhere. And that clearly has not come to pass. And so that, that, that's why I think it's really interesting that you said 2050, right? Um, it takes, th th this is really hard technology to implement. But then you're, you're highlighting the other hard thing, which is on, on the demand side, right? So on the supply side, we could perhaps create this technology, right? We could create autonomous vehicles. We, we could have it designed perfectly, but there's still the demand side, what, right? People might not want it, right? And, and so that, that, that's why I think you're highlighting 2050 is really useful because it's a reminder that um, A, these technologies are really hard to implement, but B, even if we implement them, people might not want them, right? Um, the, the, other, the other thing I like about what you sort of just highlighted um, is how we're going to get to, let, let's say, the, the state of the world in 2050 where most vehicles are autonomous. That, that by the way, I, I think that that's a reasonable guess or a reasonable prediction as to what, you know, what the world will look like. But how do we get there? And I think you're absolutely right to highlight 
uh, different use cases where you could start to see it happening. Um, and then so that sort of bites off more and more of, of you know, sort of, you know, the, the, the realm of the possible. And, and moreover, helps to increase trust on the part of consumers in, in this new technology. I mean, the, the reality with cars nowadays is that there already is a whole lot of technology in them uh, that helps with driving. I mean, just, there are tons and tons of assistive driving features, including not just the camera that you see when you, when you reverse your vehicle, but also the internal camera that the, uh, that the car itself is using that then will send, set off an alarm if it looks like there's another vehicle approaching or a person walking and you haven't, you haven't noticed and you haven't stopped. Right? There's, right? That's just one example. Another example would be lane assist or something like that. Right? So you're driving down the road and the car is keeping track of whether you're in the lane or not. And then it'll you know, start by making a sound, right? a beeping sound if you start to drift um, across the line or, or, or not even across the line, but just towards the line. And then we'll start to like manipulate the wheel a little bit right? to give like a little bit of feedback to you that you know what, you're, you're sort of drifting a little bit. Um, so there's, there's already tons and tons of technology in vehicles. And I think that we're gonna see that uh, increasing. And, the more that that increases and the more that people get used to driving with this assistive technology, then the less strange it will seem that at, at some point you can just sort of you know, hit a switch and sort of sit back and the vehicle just takes over uh, on its own. I, I, I don't think that it, it, it's too far-fetched to, to see that happening for sure by 2050. Well, from a marketing standpoint, well, the 2050 was um, when I talked to someone who worked in autonomous labs, which was a company that designs autonomous vehicles. That was his thing. I thought it was going to be a little bit sooner just because I think we have an unrealistic expectation of where technology is and isn't. I feel like our gaps of knowledge when it comes to where technology is, is that we expect like brand new iPhones every year. And we also expect all these amazing like apps and all these things. We have an unrealistic expectation there. But then the unrealistic expectation is where we also think like cars, we don't, a lot of people don't have the full information on how far cars are, but I also look at the marketing aspects of things. I think a big problem with marketing in general is the fact that it, I mean, it's a good business aspect. You want to make sure everyone can buy your product, but I also think that's his biggest kind of flaw in a sense too, is making sure that every single person can buy your product. You know, you make a drink, you make a food, you make something, you want to make sure it's not for a specific audience, but you want to make, and some companies do make things that are specific. I think with autonomous vehicles, where you'll see the most direction is, and probably more focus is if you just focus on the people that are going to be the audience for it. And I think that's going to be generations that get used to it. I mean, there's a lot of thoughts now and even my thought, like I'm an, what they would call an old soul or something like that. You know, I like my, I drive a 2000 car. That's, I don't, I don't go any newer. It's a, it's crazy to me when I can roll the windows down, use the radio without my headlights dimming because the battery is not strong enough to power it. That's what I'm used to. So when it comes to newer cars, I'm not that audience that cares about having a new Tesla or anything like that. But you see friends my age and, you know, in their twenties. They want Teslas, they want new cars, they want this other type of thing. And I go with the older generations, the only really people you're going to probably be capturing with it besides people who aren't just set in their ways are people who can't drive anymore. You know, that's the prime audience. You get your license taken away at a certain age, people that have some type of health risk or something where they have seizures while they're driving or something. Now they have an option and opportunity to drive where you can put it in there as well too but it's also about capturing the audience and that comes with the more that people interact with these types of machines right now if i told you that there was a machine out there that flipped burgers you would go oh my god well you besides you but a normal person would be holy crap that's going to take over like mcdonald's stuff that's going to take over all these fast food things and someone in the fast food industry is like getting mad because they're afraid they're going to lose their job but one, it's because they don't, they haven't seen it. They haven't interacted with that, but sooner or later, five, 10 years after that's implemented, not even that long, probably a year or two, people would just get used to a burger flipping and putting their patty in a bag. And then you take your bag and go, and you don't even think about it. You're off on your ne next task and next duty. I just think it's the way that maybe the information's released, the way that we tend to market things as well. So we, we really show people very little, unless you're involved in the field about types of technology i can give you an example is the one at the robotics uh university i think it's boston where they had the robot with the look like exactly like an android and they turned it on and the thing was like all astonished and moving around skynet was trending when that thing video came out because people really haven't seen 
the steps to build this thing. They weren't there when the head was getting placed on, the facial features were getting drawn in, the, you know, the whole system was getting set up in place, all the faults that it had. I feel like if more companies were honest about our, you know, you see a news report about Tesla killing somebody, that's horrible, but it's the news reporting it. Imagine if you had a car that talked about the number of incidences you have, like the blinkers don't turn right or this doesn't turn right. Now, it's very hard to get a company to talk trash on their own product, but it also brings in more of like, oh, you're not snake oil salesing me. Like you're not giving me the snake oil salesman type pitch routine. You're telling me your vehicle has some flaws in it and you're aware of them and you're working on them. I'm glad that makes me have more faith in you as a company, not to just rush out a product where I end up killing someone or I end up killing my whole family or something like that, all because of a feature you didn't want to fix because you were so demanded by this, the supply of how much people wanted this thing. I think it goes back to the supply and demand thing you said. Yeah, it's interesting to think about uh, the, the news cycles around a Tesla killing somebody, right? I mean, because we do see those from time to time. What's interesting is we don't see this, I mean, there's sort of two, two other types of stories, right? So um, another story would be um, a totally preventable accident in a two, so you drive a 2000 something, I don't know what, but Toyota. It, a Toyota, I also drive a Toyota. Um, so you drive, right? So, so we don't see the stories about uh, the person who accidentally killed someone while driving in a 2000 Toyota. And it could have been something that was totally preventable uh, if the you know more updated technology, let's say, was in there, right? So we don't see those stories. Um, why? Well, because they're, I hate to say it, right? But they're boring. They're not as exciting as a story about a Tesla, right? That somehow sort of speaks to our, our greatest fears about technology. The other thing that we don't see, right? This is sort of, if you will, the counterfactual that's very hard to see are the lives saved because someone is in a vehicle that has, that, you know, that's very technologically enabled, right? Because that, that, that's not at all newsworthy. Right, you know, t Tesla stopped quickly. Um, person saved. I mean, th that almost maybe is newsworthy. But all the other things that might happen in a Tesla to help protect people's lives, you, you never see that in the news. Um, I, I think the broader point that you're talking about about how the how sort of news cycles, and they could be sort of negative news cycles or even hype news cycles, um, sort of drive our expectations about how some of these new technologies are going to be playing out. So, so I want to come with that in mind, I want to come back to something that, that I mentioned at the start, which is that a lot of the research that I do is, is actually on robots and sort of economic effects of robots. Um, so, some of the recent research in the space, but by me and, and also by others, um, shows that the, the factories, right, the firms that are adopting robots actually see faster employment growth than firms that don't adopt robots, right? And that, that sort of runs counter to the popular narrative out there that robots in the manufacturing setting, in the service setting, are going to be taking over jobs, right? It, it, instead, it's like the opposite, right? It's the firms that adopt the robots that are able to grow faster, and they still need to hire people, and and so they 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 you know it's these firms that end up hiring more people, but but you don't really see those stories in the news. Instead, it's you know, bur, you know, burger flipping robot is going to take all the uh, McDonald's jobs away. Is that a temporary boost, though? Because it seems like for like the first five years when a company implements robots, you still need your your human workers as well. So you can't just do a bunch of layoffs because you don't know how That's true. well the system is going to run. So, I mean, is that just a temporary thing where eventually maybe five years, six years, seven years later, we'll see a drop off where we'll just have what everyone kind of thinks about with robots taking over their jobs, which is one person monitoring every single machine in, on an assembly line. I think you still need people, but also people who have a different, I mean, they go with the same side, but they have a different viewpoint of it, which goes, you don't need to work. You think you want to work because you're brainwashed to work because it's all we've done throughout society. Now you can just stay at home and have a robot do your job and you have more time for your family and more time for your things. And it just kind of leads into this area of like, yeah, but we still need money because money is, I don't think is ever going to get phased out, whether it changes currency. Sure. Um, but we still need to work for money, which if you get laid off from your job, yeah, you have more free time to do whatever you want, but most of the time is probably going to be spent looking for another job. You, you know, so, so Robbie, first of all, it's fascinating talking with you because every time you, you mentioned something, you know, sort of 10 other things go off in my head and then you, you didn't just mention one thing. You also mentioned like 10 things. And so now there's sort of a hundred different directions that I'd love to take the conversation. Um, just one quick thing. So on 
it, it's interesting when you mentioned about um, working, right, and having to work. We, we actually work a lot less than than we used to, than we sort of as a country, as a nation, as a civilization used to work. If you look back 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, we actually work fewer hours in the day. Um, yet, arguably, our lives are much much better off, right? Um, one of the things you could do is if you um, look back, say, to 1940 or late 1930s or something like that, um, and uh, track the sectors in the economy that have done really well since then, uh, one that's done incredibly well is leisure and hospitality. Why is that? Well, uh, it's done really well because we now have more free time and more money to spend on ourselves. And so what, what are we doing? We're you know, spending more time going out to restaurants, going on trips and vacations and, and, and things like that. And so as a result, the leisure and hospitality sector uh, has done really well. Um, so so that, that, that's just a response to your point about the, the work. Like I, I, I agree with you that um, we have this feeling that we you know, sort of do need to work, but I, I just wanna highlight that we actually work much less uh, th than we used to. Well, it's kind of the same thing with um, Walmart, for instance. Walmart, if you go to Walmart, it's mostly self-checkout. There's not really a whole lot of jobs. Honestly, I saw a cashier for the first time in a long time, probably like last week. She was an elderly woman, seemed like she had been at that company, Walmart, probably 30 something years, and they just didn't want to lay her off because she was so close to retirement. But there's just one thing open and she was going really slow and she was wearing a mask and everyone else is not wearing a mask so yeah obviously she's like kind of she's just there she just wants to show up and get that retirement and then go home and spend but she's been at the company for a while i don't think they really wanted that register open they would rather just go full self-checkout and everybody was fine with it i didn't see anybody going towards her line they were all ready to do their own thing because you work at your own pace you don't have to worry about a cashier or casher or whoever that is checking out your groceries going at a slow pace you just I, I'm in a rush. I got to get to my job. Okay. I'm going to come in here get two apples, scan, scan, done. I work at my own pace. I think people like that. But I also think that like where I stand with technology is I don't mind it implemented in some places. I don't mind it implemented at restaurants. I don't mind it implemented in all this other stuff, but I also like the human aspect too. But I don't know if that's just because that's what I have to go to when I go to an Applebee's or a Chili's. If I sit down, it's a it's a waiter or a waitress. It's not a robot. But eventually, if it's all robots, maybe I would just forget how much, you know, our memories are probably the things that hold us really tight to our convictions on things. And I think we only remember like I remember how great high school was. No, it wasn't. It was awful. I hated every moment of it. I never even showed up sometimes. So it's just my memory's foggy because I'm only remembering specific key moments rather than the whole broadband timeline of that. So if I only remember all the times I went out to eat, which is probably 10 times my entire life, but if I pick out the really good moments, yeah, there was no robots there. So I'm only thinking that it's going to affect it in such a big way, but it actually might be better if there are robots, but I just don't want to take the option away from people when it comes to having a human experience, having a robot experience, which boils down to the companies. But then we also get into another side of things where we talk about that competitive edge part. If a company implements fully technology um, into their Applebee's or something like that, then another Applebee's owner just wants human workers. Well, how long until the progress bar on number of clients served, number of good experiences that people have, were they having more experiences with the robots or the humans? Next thing you know, you see that shift of robots doing better than the humans. Then the one business owner who owns all humans or has a staff of all humans goes, man, I'm just not making the money that I need to make the money. And I got to get robots to compete with the competitive aspect of business. And it, they go, I'm sorry, it's not personal. Yeah, it's not personal, but yeah. There's this weird way that the market kind of fluctuates and I'm, I'm not a marketer. I'm not any of this, but I notice things. And when I notice things, I notice how things change and how things adapt and the way that you want to be competitive is much like if you're creating content, people like to get content, but they like content that they like. So if you're a podcaster and you're doing a, a murders podcast or something, you're going to have an audience of a lot of people who are interested in like, oh, they got them where in the in the bookshelf with the library with the candlestick, like you like that that type of stuff. But then now you're now in an audience and a market of other podcasters who are focusing on that same exact topic. So either pick a niche, like a certain character, 
like Zodiac Killer, or you start making your thing more accessible by spending money into it to make it hit larger audiences so they see you first and they get hooked to you rather than trying something new. I mean, it's not like personal, it's business and it's smart, but also a lot of like, like for me, that's just not going to work. I just don't have the time, but that's not everybody. And you watch how the market fluctuates. Eventually you see your podcast take incredibly off compared to another person who's not spending money into their thing because they have a family to feed. And eventually they give up on their podcast because they're not seeing the numbers that they want. I mean, you see it everywhere translate into, it's like, it's literally the animal kingdom, but in business and it's great. I mean, you see gas prices rise. How many gas stations are all around the same price? You see 471, four, Jesus, 470 tests <laughs> saying it out loud is insane. Um, but 472, 475, and then not, nobody's like three dollars. It's just all around the same thing. Now, is that a monopoly? We have monopolies in America. They're not really called monopolies, they're just like cable companies, one, for instance. I mean, they're all kind of running at the same kind of thing. They all kind of have partnerships with each other. It's just really good business. It's very effective to get the end goal, which is just more money. I mean, I, I look at it, everything from a business standpoint to the decisions I make in life. I go, there's what I want to do, but then what's actually good and what's actually good or what best fits my moral values necessarily might be, okay, I got to spend a little money to fix my car to make sure that my car runs in the long time. But my personal is like, yeah, but I could buy like so much candy. I could buy, I don't even eat candy, but I can buy so much like keychains, movie tickets, whatever you want. But that's not necessarily the most business savvy or profitable in the long run. Yeah. So uh, gas prices, I was driving with my son through the Poconos uh, this, this past weekend and uh, 499, 499, 499. It's almost as if they were on the phone with each other. Hey, let's make it 499. Yeah. Uh, so we pull into this one gas station. I won't, I won't, I'm not going give to give it away, right? This is now my secret uh, gas station place where I'm going to try to go. And it's, you know, 499 for, for regular. And then, you know, I'm putting my credit card in, getting ready to, to pump gas. And I notice that they've, it must have been a mistake that they made. The premium was 439. I think they meant it to be 539, but it was 439. And so I, um, I filled up, you know, my, my entire, the, the, the tank of my car with this super cheap, well, super cheap, you know, 439. Uh, I don't know what it was, um, you know, a few months ago, but 439 instead of 499, right? And moreover premium instead of regular. So I felt, I felt it was funny driving away from there after having, you know, paid for that, um, reflecting on my own feelings. Like I felt psyched, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah, I, I've got, I like, I won one for me and my team, 439. It's like, huh. Come on, man. It's gas prices. It's not, it's not, and a year it's not ago, some big thing, right? A year ago, if you would have said four thirty nine, you paid for gas, you would have been like, man, this is crazy. Prices are ridiculous. But now that the normal has been raised so high up that you got this other thing. I mean, it's just conditioning. I, I think people just, they get used to things. You'll have a couple like moments where you groan, but it's kind of like telling your kid to take out the trash. Like they're going to complain about it, but they do it. You know, it's, it's not like difficult. I think people realize that we just adjust. Um, we're not good at long-term problems. I, so, so that, so I, I take your point on that, that uh, we adjust. And sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but I wanted to sort of come back to one of the things that, that you mentioned earlier, right? So um, thinking about the economy and some of the things that, that have changed, I mean, w you know, there's sort of an active debate about why gas prices are high and we don't need to uh, go into it. It's taking us a little further away from uh, thinking about technology and things like that. But for sure, some of the recent sort of geopolitical things that are going on, some of uh, the policy in, in, in this country, sort of policy responses to COVID and things like that are part of the reason why the gas prices are higher. Um, uh, but I wanted to use that to sort of segue briefly into a discussion about one of the things that we've learned as a result of the pandemic. Right? This, this will tie into your, your points about people from a moment ago. Um, I think one of the things that we've learned is that we don't like um, doing everything that we do on, on Zoom or, or you know, pick, pick your favorite um, you know, you know, video technology. Uh, we certainly can get some stuff done, right? I mean, th this, you and I conversing this way instead of having to meet in person or something like that, this is great and, and this is very efficient. But this, this is terrible for keeping in touch with friends and family and things like that. And I think one of the things that the pandemic really, uh, for sure, I'll speak for myself, it made me 
realizes how much I really crave personal interaction. And so you were talking about robots replacing workers. Um, I think it's useful to think about uh, different places and ways in which work happens, right? So there's sort of the manufacturing setting, which we've touched on a little bit, we can come back to, but there's also that service setting, right? When you go, and, and you were talking about going into a restaurant and ordering from a person or ordering from a robot. Um, I, I would hate to, I would hate it to be the case that I only order from a robot. I like interact. That, that's actually part of the reason I go to a restaurant is I want to interact with other people, right? I want to, I, I, I like having to, uh, interact with the waiter or waitress and give my order, hear, hear what they want to suggest and, and things like that. I like going to my local bar. I don't go there all the time, but I like going to my local bar and interacting with the bartender. And I, you know, th there's a little bit of a rapport there. Um, that would be totally absent if it was me just sort of perhaps via my cell phone or whatever, you know, entering in my order and there's sort of a beer that's like automatically poured for me and then somehow served to me via a robotic arm. That'd be terrible. I, I wouldn't bother going in, right? I would just buy a beer at the store and sit at home and drink it or something like that. So again, I'm just trying to highlight that I think we really do crave human interaction. Now, could we be conditioned? Could that be conditioned away, right? This was your point about sort of conditioning. Um, I hope not. I, I hope that it's the case that we always do want to, you know, sort of on average, not everybody wants to interact with lots of other people, but like on average, you know, we're a pretty social species, it feels like. Um, hopefully, we will always crave that and always want that. And so that, that's sort of one potential um, vote in favor of not getting too freaked out about robots taking jobs. Is that, you know, that, that personal interaction is something that people actually value. Well, if I was going to ask you what would be your biggest fear with AI or biggest fear of technologies, as much as like my conversation with Roman was more about study of risk and humankind is going to eventually just be obsolete. My only fear is that we is oversight where I feel like we make very, very large gaps, like our eyes are bigger than our stomachs are, and we don't necessarily pay attention to every crucial detail. Now, I also will link business in there as well, too, because business does tend to cut corners depending on how much you're trying to make or how much you're trying to supply. I think that's a supply and demand issue as well, too. I don't think it's just the business. Like I don't see every CEO or owner of a company as some big bucks money spending guy with a waistband that's 10 times bigger than what it should be. I don't see it like that, you know, chewing a fat cigar or something. I don't see it like that, but I also go, it's very, very hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very, very hard to get someone to care about your best interest as a customer or as a this when they don't interact with you on a daily basis. This is the CEO example. You know, it, you you don't ever have your CEOs talking to your mailroom people. They don't ever come in contact with each other. There's a reason why someone's sitting on the 86th floor and you're on floor one or in the basement. There is this disconnect and this power type syndrome thing that starts to happen. But I go, if businesses had bigger interactions, if you had more humble business people, which sadly, that's not the majority. But if you had more humble business people, there would be more of an interaction and a capacity to watch this oversight issues that start to come in with cutting corners. But we live in a fast paced world. We live in a time where, like you were mentioning earlier about dates, you know, if we were having this conversation four years ago about technology, we would have thought about 2022. But really, it's like, realistically, it's like 2050, especially because we I think we don't have the best education when it comes to AI, like I'm learning so many different assets or different part of aspects of it. Um, and I, I think the general public thinks it's like your computer, oh, they have plenty of those to put in a car and next, thing you know, your car runs off this computer system. That's not exactly true. You need a lot of things like microchips and things that we don't necessarily have the resources for right now. Eventually we'll get there, but there is, when you start putting all this 100% I'm into AI cars, let's have them now. Then you try and supply what you can do that for a couple of days. Next, you know, you're like, crap, we're going to run out of inventory before we actually get the products made. So now we're, we're going to have an issue where now people are going to be yelling that and they're going to make fun of us. And they're going to see a news report because we don't have the supply for them. So I go, instead of that incentivizing people to cutting corners, if we had better oversight, I think you can have me and you would be comfortable going to a bar and having a, uh, we, we think a robotic arm pouring us a beer. I don't think it would be like that though. I think it would probably be more of a simulation or a hologram that would be doing those types of things. I think 
there are some areas where we look at it, like where would robots be implemented? That would probably be the base first draft type robots, but eventually they would perfect it where it would end up like passenger with Chris Pratt, where there's that hologram thing inside the thing. And he's having a bar and he's the only like human left besides Jennifer Lawrence, who's mad at him or something like that. Like, it's just, you get used to it and they make it better. So it gets more comfortable for you. But if there's a really good series on Netflix, it's like love human robots or something like that. They had one scenario where it was the robots taking a tour of earth and it showed how each person in each group like was divided by like liberals, libertarians, Democrats, Republicans, all these things tried to branch off to sustain themselves when the world was ending to see if they could be the last ones to survive. And they relied all their technology into robots. Now, like the can the Republicans or whoever you want to call, they were like hardcore Confederates, like hard right wingers. And they had like no, no technology. They had traps set up like old wooden traps and bear traps and guns everywhere. And they didn't last. Libertarians didn't last. They relied on a, a sea base or something like that. And all of their dropping the fishing nets, all of these types of things to get themselves food so they could party and be on the pool was in reliance of technology. Well, when the solar flares happened and when the robots decided to just give up on humans they didn't have any food resources they didn't they couldn't get food for themselves and they died out and you start leading into this point of like it's not that extreme but when we rely so much into technology to do our everyday lives we've got to understand that there's going to be some aspect of it that we're not going to be able to control my fear the more legitimate example the more normalized one not a netflix version is autonomous vehicles when you let these softwares that are all running off the same program and eventually humans can't drive anymore, what stops them from locking down your car to where you can never leave your home? And people go, well, that's like, that's intense. That's a movie scenario. Break a law and you get locked down. Oh, well, that's reasonable, right? You break a law, you get locked down. What law though? Like collecting rainwater is illegal. That's a law. Making your own milk and selling it, that's a law. You got a lot of dumb laws out there where I start going, understand that with power, there is responsibility, but with power comes an ever croaching idea of wanting more of that. And I don't think it's like Illuminati, but I also think from a business aspect, and that's just really good business. That's not even like a personal experience. That's just really great, effective strategy of you are now able to control vehicles. You can update them whenever you want. You can do whatever, all these types of things. I gave you a lot there. I see you're writing it down. That's awesome. I'm sorry. I can't help it. This is the, the professor in me and, and the old school, you know, pen and paper. And how I, I write too. I, no, I mean, I, I do a lot of research on technology, but when it comes to technology, um, you know, some, some technologies, tried and true, pen and paper, um, work just fine. Um, it's the pen. The pen in the hand is something that you just can't be beat by typing and tapping on a keyboard. That's right. Plus, it basically comes with, with built-in cryptography because no one else can understand what it is I've written here. Sometimes not even myself, right? <laughs> it's foolproof. Um, yeah, you, you, you covered a lot of, of ground there. Um, I think the point about oversight is, uh, is important, super important. I mean, it, it highlights the need for us as a society, um, meaning you know, folks here in the US, but also other countries and you know, with their laws and institutions, making sure that we have really robust institutions that from my point of view are, are democratic and um, put in place laws that protect people, right? Um, do, do we have that? Are, are we confident that our, our democracy is as robust as it could be? Um, I, I think a lot of folks would you know, question that at, at this point. Um, but, I, but I totally agree with you on that, that, that it's an important uh, point and sort of an important ingredient. Um, I, and moreover, I think I agree with you that when, you, when thinking about sort of biggest fear of AI, right? I think, I think that, that was the, the term that you used, b biggest fear of AI. I agree with you. I think it's that sort of AI unleashed in a system where we don't have uh, the right type of oversight or governance. That, that's either my, my biggest fear or second biggest fear. My biggest fear, or this it will you know, this be the second biggest fear, um, is that we don't use AI. I mean, it's closely related, okay? But so my, I, I, you know, my biggest fear is that we do have this great technology. And my biggest fear is that we actually don't 
uh, use it enough in ways that benefit society. Right? When I think about some of the really big use cases, I mean, we've talked about autonomous vehicles as one big use case, but other big use cases would be things like predictive medicine, right? Um, th thing, you know, imagine an um, AI system that's monitoring my body or something like that and realizes you know, I'm two hours away from a stroke or something like that. And so it sort of alerts me and I head to the hospital or, or what have you, or doctors are sent to me or something like that. Um, or if someone shows up at the hospital and they're showing a variety of symptoms and uh, you know, the specialists are trying to figure out what's going on and they're starting to lose the person. I mean, maybe there's some predictive system that could sort of help with the diagnosis, right? And so I, I think that there's, there's a lot of potential there. You know, medicine, I think, I think that, that that's sort of another place where there's um, a lot of potential gains for, for AI, right, right? So we talked about autonomous vehicles, maybe predictive medicine. Uh, education, imagine sort of using AI to tailor education to each person and, and their needs, and, and moreover, and anticipating demands from employers like 5, 10, 15 years from now so that people are trained up in, in um, what's needed, right? So, so I think there's a lot of potential. Uh, and, and instead, you know, right now we're seeing sort of small stuff. You, you, you've talked a lot about marketing over the course of our conversation. A lot of AI right now gets used for things like marketing. And there it's firm A competing against firm B for a customer, for Robbie, right? Um, and you know, maybe one can do it just a little bit better than the other. And, and it feels like there's a lot of effort being put into that instead of the really important stuff like transportation, mobility, uh, healthcare, education. Finance is another place where um, you, know, you see a lot of um, uh, firms, you know, hedge funds, for example, investing in uh, these algorithms that try to just get right in front of these market moves before they happen and then make money off of these small little moves. But, you know, you, you imagine putting a million dollars down on this small little move. So you make a, you know, a little bit of money there. A minute later, a different million dollars on a small, another small little move. Um, and, and so a ton of money being invested there. And it doesn't feel like that's sort of making our civilization better. It's making a few people richer, but it doesn't feel like it's making our civilization better. Um, yeah, so, so, I get, so again, coming back to, the, to what you lead it off with, my biggest fear for AI is we've got this potentially great technology and we're using it for just super mundane, not very helpful things. That strikes me as a waste. Even when I talk about the issues with ethics, it all boils down to the same basic concept, which is user experience. I don't put a low bar on people, but I do have a low bar set for people just because if anything, you go above and beyond the bar. But the way that we tend to use technology necessarily isn't for a benefit. Now, if we're talking about medical advances, when I say the words virtual reality, the first thing you think of probably is like video games, like headsets you can put on and go into these digital worlds for your kids so they can leave you alone and play on the iPad or whatever. But what about the simulations for surgeries where people can practice a billion times and learn how to do medical? medical procedures without actually having to deal with that medical procedure on hand. Now you're having someone learn about expertise and get a better uh, realistic view of what happens when they're placed in that scenario. I mean, that's a way more beneficial route. I would like to lock down AI only into certain groups, but also my main important thing, and when I mean certain groups, I mean certain fields. I don't mean like certain like wealth classes. I mean, just certain fields, like we should have specific areas where AI should be implemented and other areas where it can be used. It, it's just like having a cell phone, you can choose to use it or you can put it down. I don't think it needs to require 100% on that. But when you implement AI technology or when you implement just advanced technology in general, you have to understand that if it's better and it's safer and it's all these types of things that they market in these giant block letters on an advertisement while you're watching one of your stories, Game of Thrones, whatever you want to say, it's always going to be like, well, if it's safer, then this should be the majority and we shouldn't allow the minority part. And that's where it goes down again, where I go, it's not AI technology. I used to think wouldn't be dangerous because of human experience, but also if you're creating something that can think on its own, eventually what determines what's right and wrong. When I was talking to Roman who studies existential risk, he brought up something really important where he goes, imagine if you have a bunch of people feeding into these simulators, these things to produce, like what's the best answer for like renewable energies or curing cancer. Is it going to find the right answer? I'm like, well, if everyone agrees on a certain point and you put it in there, then it's a smart machine. It should figure it out, right? He goes, yeah, but the information that's being funneled into it, imagine if the robot thinks the way to cure cancer is by 
killing you. Like that sounds crazy, but he's done these simulations and this is kind of where he got the pessimistic side of things. And he's not wrong. I just think when we say like, to me, even saying it sounds sci-fi. And I think when we look at what's really wrong with technology, it's necessarily not the technology that doesn't think on its own. The one that does think on its own, I think that's still user experience. But I also think that it does evolve in other measures that we just weren't prepared for, uh, which is good. That's, that's intelligent life to me. But I look at, we really need to take the politics out of things. I, I, I've heard so many people from the London Board of Futurists and so many people who talk about the transhumanism, the sci-fi, like the crazy robotic technology, which I mean, 50, 60, 70 years, maybe we'll get there. We have prosthetics that are being done with robotics now. I mean, it's not that far, I guess. But if we stick more in a real world, what we have now basis, I think politics boils into everything. And it's funny because I bet you we would have the answer to renewable energies, which is a rabbit hole I've dived down into so many times. But whenever I reach out to someone, they have bias. And that goes back to our user experience. Someone tells me coal power is the most effective form of energy. And I go, okay, well, let me see who you work for. It's they're a mining, they're, they're a university that studies mining. Now, is that true? I don't know, but all your answers you're going to give me are going to be completely biased in that field now because that's the one you side with the most over solar and all these other things. Now, I get the information that they have, but every single side of renewables from solar, wind, hydro, whatever you want to say, they all have enough information to back where they stand. And it gets to this point of like, I think we, we've lost a piece of ourselves because this has dived into politics. I think not just politics, but I think it's just competitiveness. We have competitive, which I think there can be healthy competitive aspects in business, like somebody incentivizing to work harder because another company is working harder, friendly competition. But that's not the business that's been built here. The business that's been built here is pretty cutthroat in a lot of aspects of things. And it's not necessarily bad, but if someone makes a good product, um, Really good example. Really good example. I'm not going to rant much longer, but really good example. A lot of uh, industry producers from the United States, a lot of companies that were starting over here, small companies, not huge manufacturers, but very small, like someone like me that created like Bitcoin or something like that, goes over to China and they start thinking they, they can work the system because these the people there don't speak very good English. So there's this unrealistic expectation that your knowledge is somehow based in English. And that means that you're going to be more intelligent at business than these people. When really they end up buying the companies from these people, cutting them out. And then they don't own any of their own company that they started. And these people now go and profitize off their company. One weird example I can give you is that Google is not allowed in China. That's not just the aspect of the free range of the internet, but it's because they tried to buy Google at one point and they couldn't control Google. The guys, was, the company was a little bit more structured than they thought. It's not like buying a new company. It's a little bit more produced and everything. So you can't own, Google just wanted to make its own platform there, but China realized that's not controllable and they decided not to have it. And you get into this aspect of like, there's a lot of like weird kind of like, I get it because it's business and it's like business doesn't have feelings. It's just about making sure that you're getting money and you're keeping yourself established. But that's a weird world that we live in. I mean, if I was a kid, he would have told me like, hey, like, Robbie, any dream you have, you can produce it. I'm like, really? Like, I can own my own like cereal, like anything I want. Shaq can monetize my cereal. It would be awesome, but then you grow up and you kind of realize like, holy crap, there's a lot of things. You need to have patents. You need to have FDA regulations if you're going to be producing cereal. You need to have all these. And you start realizing that like a lot of it deters people from starting their own business. Um, one more example, and I'll, I'll, I know I see you writing down a lot of stuff, but one more example is during the pandemic for, I mean, ooh, most, I think all my life, they, before the pandemic, they talked about how easy it was to start your own business how easy it was to be your own entrepreneur. Then during the pandemic, you had the option to be your own entrepreneur. A lot of people started baking bread at home. A lot of people started starting their own farm. A lot of people started their own online companies and they realized it was a lie. 
a lot of those businesses went under. They sales pitched that it was the easiest thing to be your own business person and not everybody was doing it. And at the time was true. But then when the door opened up with the pandemic that everyone can start their own business online, everyone goes, I've seen all the ads for so long. I guess I might as well take my shot. And they realized, no, it's a corporate owned world. It's going to try any way to really squeeze you out. That's why, like, I think it's like the first five years of business or something like that. They don't profit. Like, it's like, it's to me, I go, that's a crazy dark world we live in, but is it, or is it just a really, really, really like business tied kind of market? I mean, it's for the market. I don't know if it's good or bad. I've heard people complain about the market's crap or this. I'm like, I think it's just crap because the way we're viewing it, I think we think it's going to be this way. And really, it's a whole nother way. I bet you there's a lot of people out there with a fat cigar on a yacht, loving the market. And that's because they've been in it since the beginning. You know, there's a lot of that. So you so again, you, you, you've highlighted many different things. I, I, I'm just going to my mouth went up. dry talking. so <laughs> much. I, I'm, I'm just going to uh, sort of pick up on on something at the very end. Um, which is on uh, new businesses, right, or business formation. So if you look historically in the U.S., you know, back in the 19, you know, mid-1970s or so, um, every year, roughly 15, you know, I might have the number slightly off, but, you know, roughly 15% of the businesses were brand new businesses founded just that year. Uh, now it's at about, and again, I might have it off slightly, but, you know, now it's at about 8% or so. So, and if you look over time, there's been a very steady, you know, downward drop in uh, percent of businesses that are new businesses, right? And so this is, this is a, a fact, right? That comes from government statistics. It's not controversial. I think what's controversial is, you know, maybe interpreting how that, you know, what that mean, you know, why that might be and whether that's a good thing or bad thing and things like that. But again, just to state the fact, over time, uh, there's been less and less uh, firm entry rates than there used to be. And th th this, by the way, is sort of a, um, I mentioned at the start that I do a lot of work on technology, uh, you know, competitive strategy, especially as it pertains to technology. I also have been doing a fair bit of work around entrepreneurship. And so th this is something I've been trying to uh, understand a little bit. Um, there are a number of economists that, that are trying to understand this decline, you know, sort of declining entry rates which uh, some people feel like is an indicator of a decline in competition between firms, right? In other words, there are, there are for some reason, there are these declining entry rates. So there must be entry barriers that are preventing these firms from coming in. And you highlighted what some of them could be. I mean, you, with the serial example, you highlighted the FDA regulations and things like that. So it could be that maybe there are more regulations now than there used to be, but they're also, and that might be probably part of the story, but there's probably multiple different pieces of the story. Um, one of them could be just that startup costs now are higher, like putting aside regulation. You know, if, if you, you, know, you no longer just open up your, uh, like a window front, on the side of your house and start selling a product, you have to invest in digital marketing, for example, computers and things like that. So maybe startup costs are a little bit higher. Um, maybe also it's the case that there are now fewer firms that are, you know, sort of controlling more of the economy. And these, these folks are, or these firms are gatekeepers. And it's sort of harder to, to enter because you have to interact with these folks um, and, and, and then you know, they, they make it difficult for you. Um, so, so in any case, that, that, that's sort of a trend that, that we do see in the data. During the pandemic, however, that trend reversed itself, at least temporarily, you know, we'll, we'll see, but there was a huge spike in uh, new businesses during the pandemic. Um, that, that spike has not continued. I mean, it looks like it's come back down, but we'll sort of see what, the, what, what happens with the trend. Um, I think you're right that that part of that was due to um, I don't I don't I don't know if it's marketing, but you know, sort of stories out there that like, look, you, you might have lost your job because of the pandemic. You're no longer making as much income, so create a side hustle, right? C come up with your own uh, consulting business or your own bakery or or you know that you're doing out of your kitchen or whatever. Um, I, you know, economists are super interested in this, and as are policymakers and and folks are trying to understand it. I think you provided some anecdotes about what um, you know uh, could have been happening there, but we'll we'll, we'll see what, once people start sort of digging into the, the the data a little bit more. I think 
the like especially with the business market it's kind of like i learned it from content creating once you get a certain number of things and the algorithm kind of just tricks you up in a sense like if you get a number of subscribers my buddy had for the longest time like a very low amount of subscribers and then next you know he hit a thousand from doing like a couple of videos with some high important guests and then now he's got over like a hundred thousand and I mean, that was only in a couple month period but he realized he was getting like 50 to 100 to 200 something subscribers like a weekly basis type thing and it was just the algorithm tripped it up and it's the exact example people have always said is that it seems like the rich get richer when you're successful, you're now a, a, an object. You're now something that has worth in it. And that scene is where people want to shove value into it, whether that's an algorithm tricking you upwards or whether that's people funding your business. I think there should be more options for, you know, small startups or things that really, I mean, you want to see a backlog of like your, someone's history. Like you want to make sure this person's not like in gambling debts and everything before you owe the, give them $10,000. But I also think there's not a lot of options for new kind of endeavors for people to go to as much as we live in this market that says you can start your own business whenever you want. I just think that it's about that time as well, too. I bet that number or that when you see that number drop from all the people that started a business during the pandemic, I mean, a lot of it goes into how many people ran out of their savings in their bank account. I mean, you have 50,000 in your bank at the time, it might seem like to start a good business, but then is it going to dwindle down, dwindle down so you have nothing left and then you have to get out of your business that you funneled all this money into? I mean, a lot of the people that I've heard of who own their own businesses talk about an aspect of like it took five years, it took six years to start making money, and then you're seeing their bank accounts slowly start to rise. But when people don't see anything after two years and three years, they think that it's just maybe it's them, maybe they're not fit for it, and it deters them out of it, and now they're out money rather than – you know, eventually seeing a growth in it. I think it's about the time you put in. I also think that consistency is kind of crap. I do a daily show and it's not the key to success. Um, I just, you, you got to understand that it, it it's the time pace. The time pace is different for every single person. If we talk about what I would do, if I like wanted to take everything out of politics, I think when it comes to ethics, I think when it comes to oversight, I think when it comes to creation, I think when it comes to anything that really happens to do with matters on focusing on problems that might arise is you need to have people that are specifically not involved in the corporations that are doing this. And this is something I got into, uh, into recently I'm trying to get guests for, which is industry-influenced research. On ResearchGate and all these academic sites, I started coming across, like I mentioned with the mining example, people that would do a study showing that there is a way to sustainable mine. Then I check what their author affiliations are, and it's Exxon or some type of thing that runs off what a mine would produce. And you start going into, how do I know if your research isn't influenced by the business that is giving you the money to do your research. We have a lot of biases and I don't think I don't like I don't think politicians are all like give me the millions of dollars and I'll pass whatever you want. I don't think it's exactly 100% there might be a small percentage maybe. Um that's a safe bet. But I I also don't think it's every single person. I think you get a lot of movie hype and there's a lot of stuff about like this is how this is going to be. I don't think it's like that. I just think that it is I mean if I was a employee at a company, I'm not going to sit there and say my company's crap in my business. I'm not going to do that. It's just not smart. And I think that's when you read these research studies and stuff. And what really sucks is that data and that information is what we go off of because it's a scientific study. And I think that boils down to some really dangerous stuff where you have people saying like, what's science? It's like, well, we got to understand that there is science, but we also have to understand is that what we are deeming as science, a lot of the stuff is influenced by a lot of things. I think it's not just politics. It's just money. It's just a lot of stuff. If you really want real data, real information, have someone who's passionate. Like I would hire you to go study something about AI, but I wouldn't, I don't have a, I don't have a company in AI. But who's hiring the people to go research AI is the people who are working in AI. Like, it's just, it's like the snake biting its own tail. I'm over here like, hold on a second. I'm 24 years old. Is nobody else seeing this shit. Like, I just, I hate to say it like that, but it's, it's true. And it, I don't think like, um, 
the world is set up to be this dark thing. I don't think that at all. I just think we've allowed a lot of things that probably wouldn't have happened 10, 15 years ago happen because of some, some certain circumstances. I'm not saying pandemic. I'm just saying with the time pace on a lot of things. I mean, it's easier to get your business out there by putting more money into it or, you know, reaching out to famous people to promote your show and stuff like that. I mean, that makes sense, but is it more fulfilling? I don't know. I guess people like money, but I mean, for someone who's not interested in that aspect of things, I guess it's just a different route that I kind of see. And that's just not with content production. That's with any type of thing. I mean, we live in a business world and I think it can be more suitable for personal aspects as well, too. I just, I have a lot of ideas of how to get there. Um, I just don't know if it'll ever be really obtainable until we get into this aspect where a lot of stuff has been not really controlled by you anymore. I think we have a lot of that user experience I was talking about. AI will fix that, some of it, but we have to be careful because AI can be user experience influenced. And that's where the line I think needs to be drawn. Um, Robbie, again, you know, you're sort of highlighting many different things. I, I like that you came back to something that you were, that you sort of touched on probably maybe 10 minutes ago. And, and this is the role of, let's call it sort of expertise Right. So, and you've referred to this mining study um, a, a few times in our conversation. So, a couple of thoughts on this. I mean, first of all, what, what I like about it is that, um, and, and I don't know the, I have no idea who it is that you're talking about or, you know, groups of people or, or whatnot. But um, part of the reason why you know that this individual has been funded by a mining company is because this individual discloses it to that individual's credit. Right. I mean, they it sounds like they have it on their website or on their paper that you found on ResearchGate or something like that. They describe where they got their funding from. Um, and so I'm I'm totally fine with that. Um, if people are being funded by industry or, or whoever they're being funded by, so long as they disclose it so that now you as you know, an interested and educated public who's reading the research paper, you can then form your own opinions about the science that's being done in it. So I, so I think that there's some of that. Now, now, there's no regulation on that, right, by the way, but and um, no sort of formal regulation, although I should say that different universities have their own, they're called institutional review boards that sort of require, uh, you know, professors or, re, or you know, professional researchers to, dis, um, to disclose the funding that they're getting. So, so we do have that at that sort of institutional level. Um, I think that that's one of the fixes. To, to this general problem that you're describing. And I, I would call it a problem in the sense that if there's too much of this that, that's not disclosed, then we start to lose trust in experts. And, and I think we, you know, we do want to be able to trust sort of on average experts that are saying, you know what, I know, I know a lot about, let, let's say the economics of AI and robots. And so let me sort of describe stuff to you. And, and I want people to be able to trust that when I say it, right? And so it, it's incumbent on me to act in such a way that what I say is trustworthy. And so one of the ways to do that is to disclose whenever one is getting money or if you know, money from an, from an industry source is funding a specific study or something like this. Um, so that, 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 that's one thing I wanted to highlight. Um, I also wanted to come back to um, your description of um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the sort of, uh, I think you said the, the executive with the waistband that was 10 sizes too big. And, and I, I sort of visually did the like dollar signs for the eyes, right? Um, you know, smoking the big fat cigar. I think you said, you know, I think we have in mind like the, like the logo or the mascot for like Monopoly, right? The Monopoly game. He's got like a little top hat maybe or something like that. Um, so it, that's certainly a caricature of, of some of what happens. But I, I do have to say like some of the... Um, some of the, I mean, one of the things I've done is um, field research where I've gone to factories that are putting in place robots and other types of automation, set sensors, uh, AI in some cases, you know, just all different types of automation um, to try to get a sense of why firms are doing this, uh, what's happening to the employees there and things like that. And for sure, some of the things that I see and have heard from managers of these firms is, you know, we're, we find that sometimes our human employees are unreliable and we feel like a robot would be more reliable. 
for sure I hear stories like that. Other stories though that I hear from, you know, from a different factory would be, well, uh, we've got a lot, you know, our, our human employees, they've been with us for, you know, 20, 30 years in some cases, they have a ton of expertise. We certainly don't plan to get rid of them. No way. Like we, we'd actually like lose knowledge about how to produce some of these products. But we think that a robotic arm in this specific instance would actually really augment what it is that the human is doing, you know, what it is that Jake, who's been with us for however many years. So I, I, I think that there's, uh, I think that there's a variety of different ways that firms can be organized and are organized, some of which view humans as just like a cog in the production wheel, if you will, but others view them, you know, view their human employees very much as individuals that they know that they've you know, had meals with, uh, you know, they've been to their weddings and things like that, and, and really appreciate the knowledge that those workers, that that, that, that individual uh, brings to whatever it might be, the production process, the service process, or, or whatever it might be. So, so again, I, I just want to highlight that, that I really think that there, are, that there are many different ways that firms can and do organize themselves. But that, wouldn't that be more small scale? Like if you had one or maybe two of the same uh, business under the same company, like not something like a, a chain of businesses. It's very hard for a lot of those people. I just think it's an easy way to incentivize people to have human employees. Oh, oh yeah. That, that's a good point on the incentives, but let me just very quickly give you a, a quick response to that. So um, you obviously read, you know, the anecdotes that I gave were from, you know, mostly small manufacturing businesses in the Midwest, uh, Ohio, Indiana, Michigan. Um, uh, Elon Musk, though, just, just for example, right, has said that when he set up the, I think it's called the Giga Factory, this was like his really big, you know, factory that he set up in, in Nevada. The vision he had was that it would be, you know, no humans, all robots. And he didn't achieve that vision, but he certainly put in place lots of robots. And he's, he's gone on, on record saying, you know, he sort of put in too much automation. He should have had more human workers. And I, and I think even has taken out robots in some cases. Uh, Toyota, at one of its manufacturing plants, some, somewhere in the South, I forget which state exactly, um, you know, built a new factory and sort of put in place a bunch of robots. They, they ended up taking out some of the robots and putting human workers um, back in. So, so I, I don't think that the sort of phenomenon that I'm describing is just about, you know, small businesses. I, I think we see this across a range of different types of businesses. I th also think that a lot of people that criticize like the big people like in government or something that criticize certain people like Elon Musk, I know a lot of people are criticizing him for his, um, the way that he like, why aren't his workers unionizing or something like that? Like, well, a company only gets a union strike or some type of union forming if there's an issue that's happening. I mean, if the employees, the employees were actually incentivized, you get stock in Bitcoin or Tesla, I think. Yeah, you get stock in Tesla, if um, which produces makes people want to produce better for their company, which incentivizes raises the stock up. So you make more money in turn. People are like, well, that's terrible. It should just give them money. It's like, well, hang on. You can't compensate people for a hypothetical idea if the stock goes up or down. But then they get mad and they say, well, the government needs to handle that. Then they start attacking Elon Musk. It's much like the Tesla example. What about all the good stuff with cars? You're just reporting the bad stuff. But if you notice, Elon was the only person who didn't attend the meeting that Biden had at the White House because it was about electric cars. They were like, if you give us a certain amount of electric cars under our electric car bill, then we'll, 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 we'll fund you. We'll do all this. Elon said no because he realized, oh, this is stupid. Why would I do extra work to help you? It doesn't make sense. I'm going to – because Elon's a separate – entity he's a whole different thing yes i don't want him owning twitter i mean i don't mind if he owns twitter but i don't think he's like a savior in the light I, as people think that that's what that means by if you're happy if he owns twitter i don't think that at all i just he's got money to do whatever he wants i don't expect him honestly i don't expect him to even have human employees i mean i wouldn't if i owned a company i would probably want to have less issues of people calling out of work than possible but there is a way where we're heading into this the the people that complain about the market or complain about people like elon that have fully autonomous vehicles behind closed doors they're doing the same thing they're doing the exact same method of business and i start going if you're going to in public criticize people who are playing your business game, then you have to understand that to adapt to your business strategy of how the world's been running with this dog eat dog kind of mentality, 
you have to now incentivize what you wouldn't have incentivized if you would have went a different way. Incentivize having human employees, people who get human employees to be on staff and have their work done and also be able to produce and shouldn't have to feel like they're getting an uncompetitive edge against people who have an all machine business because we can't stop the machines. That's going to happen. So incentivize these People like we were talking about the Midwest people that own companies and have human employees and like going to barbecues and throwing events, incentivize them for having human employees. Good on you. You didn't take the market route out and don't worry, you'll get like a tax break or something. I have no clue. It's, that's a small thing. It's a dumb example, but it's a small, crucial thing I think we need to pay attention to. No, I, I think your um, this your point about incentives is 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 a great point. And and you mentioned about taxes, right? So it turns out that in, in this country, we actually, in, in terms of the way the tax system is set up, we favor capital over labor. And we could, we could change that. We could, we could try to adjust it such that capital is taxed at the same rate as labor. We could even like shift it even more such, such that labor is, is heavily you know, subsidized and capital is taxed more or something like that. I mean, it's, it's not up to me, obviously, to decide you know, which of these, and it's not an area that I do much research in, but for sure it's true that we... Uh, heavily benefit investments in capital instead of investments in, in labor. And, uh, you know, it, th th this could be something where if, you know, if it does look like, um, if it does look like firms are adopting these newer technologies at a, you know, fa at, at a rate that, that, that's like really fast and using this to replace workers, this is something that we could use the tax system to try to address. Now, I'm not necessarily like in favor of that or, or not. But I, I totally take your point and agree with you that there are ways to incentivize more investment in uh, workers in, in our companies. Do you think a lot of stuff boils down to not, I know we talked about user experience before, but do you think it's just about seeing the big picture? I feel like a lot of people, like even in this common example I can think of is just politics. A lot of people blame like Biden or they blame Trump and it's not an opinion on Biden or Trump. I just go, you understand this system has been running a lot longer than those people have even been in office. Like you got to look at the grand scale of when society started with marketing, the industrial revolution, whatever you want to say, the way, the direction that we've been heading. This has been something that's been going on in this direction for a very long time. Now, there are things that aggress it and there's things that help out with tension as well. That can be a political leader or whoever. But I go, when we really look at the basic aspect, the way that we've programmed our human instinct to kind of lead down to is about making more money, is about doing all these things that in some, if I told you about you know, time, if I told you about this, like, I think it's like 90 something percent of people have an unrealistic expectation of their time. It's just because they think that they're not doing enough Their people feel like they have too much time people. There's just this weird kind of cognitive understanding of time that people have these different gaps of knowledge. in. now if we boil down to what they, people feel like they should be doing to feel more fulfilled. We should incentivize people to feel more fulfilled rather than feeling like they need to work a bunch of jobs to survive. You know, that's the basic understanding. When you ask someone, how's life going? They're like, I'm here or I'm surviving or I'm doing this. It's like, does that sound fun? But it's the way that the world's kind of been. I don't think it's necessarily the world's evil. I just think we've been in this like, eyes too big for our stomachs type mentality for a really long time. I mean, if you could take it back, I, I, I like really old history when it comes to like industrial revolution, when it comes to like the invention of certain like materials that are really produced in advanced society, even though uh, Nikola Tesla, I think he was a great inventor, even though he was kind of nuts in a sense. I think you need to be that to be a good creator too. But I think people look at like like I, I actually I'll boil it down to something even more important than I said in the beginning. We're not good at long problems. We look at renewable energies. You tell me the earth is warming and it, by 2100, 2200, the ocean levels will rise four inches or whatever, four feet. I don't know. You just gave people a really long like long-term problem and we're not good at those we're fourth quarter people we've always been fourth quarter people at that last moment we do something that literally scoops us out of the danger zone and brings us back to something that's where you can tell with media media for the longest time was telling you the world is going to end tomorrow and you need to do something now well people lost trust 
I think you, there's a way to really get people to get motivated about doing things. And I think that all starts with a trickle down effect. I think that boils down to business. I think that boils down to economies. I think that boils down to a lot of stuff, but there's people conflating issues that shouldn't be conflated. You shouldn't be blaming your president for the way that your country is going. You need to look at the system. We live in a system run system. I mean, that's a bad example. System run environment. I think that boils down to real issues. I think that boils down to any emerging technologies that come out. I don't really care for politics. I really don't, but it does boil down to a lot of that stuff as well, too. I didn't vote, so I don't have, like, I'm not like a Biden or a Trumper. I just, I, I just, I, I'm, I can't focus on that. What I do focus on is real problems, things that I can change. The fact that there's a lot of stuff that should be being addressed in your own communities that aren't being addressed. I had a person on here. I'll give her a shout out because she made an amazing book, Nancy Weiss. If you look up Judge Rothenberg Center on your phone or whenever we get done with this chat, it was a place that shut down in 2021 and they've had 11 people die at this facility. It's where they shock mentally challenged people. It's a horrible place. It shouldn't be running it for as long as it did. It's probably the one of the episodes I've ever cried on. They basically shocked a kid 79 to 100 and something times, gave him third degree burns on the side of his head. This kid has severe autism and um, he, uh, acute stress disorder. This is a place that shut down when everyone was worried about grandma during the pandemic. But you know what people complain about? Is that there's places like, oh, Biden did this or Trump is a monster. There's real things you can affect change in, and that's how you'll see the whole system play in a part. When you really affect something like tearing down that facility, there's billions of them out there. So let's try and tear, well, not billions, but there's thousands of them out there. Just start working and trying to find these things. Rise up, speak, talk about it on the news. Uh, the opioid crisis that's going on right now, 100,000 people last year from the ages 19 to 49 died of an opioid uh, uh opioid overdose i mean and that wasn't reported on the news and i'm not saying news is the issue but i also think that our attention is focused in some huge huge long like long goal things environment is something we should care about but also do you hear people complaining about it or yelling at other people that they need to affect change now but i don't hear any good talks being produced about it i see debates when i watch presidential stuff I don't see conversations and I, 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 I'm not like a, Oh, I'm this enlightened human form. I'm just looking at it. Like we got to find somewhere to like drop your anchor. And we, we're not anywhere all over the board. I think it really boils down to some bare roots on some things as well too. But I think those need to be talked about. You can't have stigmatized topics in this world. You just can't renewables. Can't be one politics. Can't be one religion. Can't be one vaccines. Can't be one. You need to talk about all aspects of everything and respect every single person's opinion, much like I respect your opinion when you come on the show and your expertise and your perspective, because when you consider someone's point invalid, then I'm no longer your equal. Yeah, you, and you know, the one, um, the one that you le left off your list is guns. Guns are a good right? one too. Yeah. You got to talk Another about one. guns. I don't own a gun, but. Yeah, no, it's, I, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely, I mean, I think this, the sentence that you ended on, or maybe it was the second to last sentence, I think is, is crucial, which is, um, you know, if you don't respect somebody, that, that, that's not the way you said it. Um, I, I, I don't remember exactly how you said if, it. But you if said, you don't value the things that I say, then I'm no longer your equal. Okay. I yeah. probably said it differently. <laughs> yes, something like that. No, but I, but I think it highlights um, an important point that I agree with, which is that we've got, we just, we have not been doing a good job of talking with each other about ways to fix issues in the country or ways to move the country forward and things like that. I, I don't know what the answer is to that, but I, but I totally take the, to, to take your point on that, that, you know, sort of, it feels like discourse isn't working in the way that it, that, that it, that it could, or the way that it should. Um, I, you know, so, so another, another thing that you mentioned is that uh, I think you said that we are fourth quarter people. I think that's right. I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's like a human thing or, or, or what, but, you know, th things like climate change or some of, these, some of these things that really like unfold over a long period of time. I think it's really hard for us to see and, and react to. And, and we're much more, for, for whatever reason, we react to stuff that, that, that's much more immediate. Um, I, I don't know what's going to change on, on that front either. 
Um, I, I will say one thing though, the, um, so, so you were mentioning about what motivates people in their job and, you, and you're mentioning about money, right? The paycheck and things like that. So I, I work at a business school, right? I, I teach at the, as I said at the start, the NYU Stern School of Business. Uh, most of who I teach are MBA students, right? Masters of Business uh, Administration. Uh, th these are folks that, you know, um, they're focused on a business career. They're not focused on a policy career. They're not going to go teach, you know, children in school. They're not going to do, do medicine or something like that. They're, they're going into business. Um, and yet what I find really interesting when I, when I talk with my students about this is that, yes, they're motivated by money, but for sure that is not the only thing that they care about. They care uh, or at least many of the students care very much about the culture of the place that they're going to work for. And culture is not necessarily that there's good culture, bad culture. There's sort of a, a range of different cultures. And for some students, they feel like they're a very good fit for the culture at this firm. Other students feel like they're a good fit for the culture at that firm. And, you know, again, these different cultures might, might vary, but you can imagine some of the cultures, some of the cultures might be like a cutthroat investment banking culture, right? Other cultures might be one where uh, you're encouraged to work closely with the other folks that are on your team. Uh, you get rewarded with team-based pay. You get rewarded, you know, sort of, sort of incentive compensation where you get stock in the company or something like that. Um, and, and there's a lot of focus put on maybe developing you as an individual and things like that. So again, I, I just want to highlight that, you know, I think that people are motivated by different things. And I see that with, with the students that I interact with. And moreover, I think firms are organized in ways that you know, in some cases could be really focused on just earning money and other cases could be focused on sort of developing the employee, interacting in a certain way with your customer and things like that. Well, I'll, so, give, so, an, I'll, about to say, I'll give an example during this podcast when you said my name. I don't know what it is, but if you watch any of my episodes out of the a thousand something I have, whenever someone says Robbie, you see my eyebrows go up and because it's you're normalizing, you're humanizing me. It's not just like you're talking to just a blank thing. You're now in the actual conversation that we're in. And to me, that's everything. It's an amount of respect. I have an authority issue, but it comes down from an aspect of respect. My old work used to treat me like complete trash. But when it was my birthday, I got a card from my manager. I got a bunch of stuff and that one day made up for the 364 that were dog trash because you treated me like I'm a human being and you remembered that. I think in my moral values when it comes to business, if I was an owner of a company, I would get to know my employees and remember their birthdays. But I also wouldn't be owning a manufacturing company like Bezos. I wouldn't be owning all those types of things. I get it. It's a great way to make money, but I just, that's too much anxiety for me. But even the spot where I'm work, we have four locations. I think a total of like maybe eight employees at each location. It's a fitness industry. I don't ever get a birthday text. None of these people really understand or know my name. Nobody knows anything like that aspect of stuff. You, It's like one person on staff the whole time. And then that's a shift. It's like, so you're not incentivizing me to want to work hard and make you money. You know, it's like there's really crucial aspects of business when it boils down to those human features, the stuff that we can tend to neglect when a company gets too big. Now, I'm not saying every company needs to run that way. There's going to be other people who don't agree maybe with me or don't agree with you and want to have the biggest companies, the most amount of companies and expand everywhere. And they don't really care to know their employees. That's good because, I mean, for them, it's about making money. It's not about that human aspect. But I also think the weird kind of double-edged sword here is we love technology and it's a great business tool. But what it does is socially isolate us from some human empathetical aspects of things. And that only makes the business industry get tougher and worser when it comes to the aspect of human conditions. What is interesting, though, is over the year and over the past two years, you saw a lot of people strike. Kellogg's, mm -hmm, for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of this stuff. That's very important to recognize an inner crucial problem. I do have some conspiracy thoughts on why they were publicizing that on TV, because I don't think we would have ever seen that if it what there isn't something else. We're some, there's something we're not seeing. There's no way Kellogg's doesn't have the money to bribe off CNN. There's no way. Um, but we saw that and we saw people talking about it. We saw a lot of this stuff. And I think it was a great way to show that people with general of the same interests and are generally in the same conditions, they'll do anything to team up together and work together. So how do we show people that we're all in the condition of being human? We're all in the condition and the circumstances that we're in. And this business doesn't just affect one of us. It affects all of us. Now, there are certain people that tend to 
get higher up. And here's a, this is like a, uh, probably people won't agree with this kind of controversial. I think you need to share how much you make. I think if you're an employee talking to another employee, it was refreshing when someone told me they were making 1275. I was like, you're making 1275. They're like, yeah. And they're a new hire. I'm like, I've been here three years. I'm making 1250. What? And what happened was, is when I got my pay increase, they raised minimum wage and I never got adjusted. So you get into this aspect of like, now I can message my boss. My boss is like, oh my God, I'll fix that for you. There you go. That would have never happened if I wouldn't have had that conversation. We wouldn't have been open about that. It's not necessarily thinking that you do more work. You need to be paid more. I mean, in a sense, that could be true as well, too. But also, you need to understand your value as an employee as well, too. You're going to remain miserable if you feel like you're being gypped the whole time. You got to address these things. These what we call stigmatized topics. People would say you can't, should never disclose how much you make. Why? There's no answer to that. It's, it's private. What is that? It's private. Okay. What, the, what is that? Like, what is private? Like you follow up with 10 questions on anything. I guarantee you people will fall off around six or seven. It's just, it's not. And that's, that's coming from someone that studies threat analysis and threat detection and stuff that I've had on the show, but it's not a dumb thinking. It's logical thinking. I think people really should just things that we probably deter from are probably things we should be more attracted to, you know, these discussions of having things that could be like, you shouldn't be walking into life. Like everything's a landmine. You should be walking into it, like not worried about so much as well. Yeah. My, uh, my brother lives in Norway. Um, he, he, uh, met a, a, uh, a Norwegian woman when, when he was in graduate school here in the U S and, and moved to Norway, married her. They, they have a kid. Um, I, I bring this up because um, in Norway, all salaries are posted online. So everybody can look and see what everybody else makes. That's bold. Um, That's that bold. is bold, right? It's, and so, you know, but it's uh, related to your <laughs> comment earlier about, you know, just sort of, you know, discussing what you make. You know, th there it's a government policy that you see what everybody makes. Um, I mean, it's, it, it's that, it's just, I, I think it's just so when I say it's bold, I think it's just because we don't have anything like that. And that just sounds so crazy, but to them, it's probably normal. I think, um, especially if we bring it back to AI a little bit too, I think with the amount of technologies too, I think I would probably fund more, like I would put money towards groups that would be incentivized into trying to understand these things a little bit more. I think between your area of focus with robotics is probably different from someone who's in the transhumanism department, which talks about putting technology into your body. I mean, they go a little bit a hundred years forward. And I've talked to every single major voice in that field. I just think if you guys sat down together and talked about some things with AI I think you guys like would have this total agreement on so many things, no matter where your perspectives are on technology, you might have a more realistic sense. They have a more fantasy sense like 3d printing or quant is it it's quantum archeology, span which is 3d printing a moment from a picture, the whole environment, which literally recreates that moment in time, not like a statue, but actually can produce a living version of yourself from this image, like me right now at this moment, I could have a 3D copy and that 3D copy could be from exactly that moment, exactly how I was thinking and feeling at that time, which is, that sounds so crazy, but I mean, to them, it's so normalized, but that's their, that's their line of study. That's their work. That's what the London board of futurists and all these people do. And it's just like, if you just sat and talked to them, you realize their ideas aren't that far-fetched. It's literally like, I can get your pathway that you're on, which is, I think, crucial to understanding anything. I, one of the things I've enjoyed about our conversation so far is uh, hearing you describe some of the other podcasts that you've done, because I'm, I'm making notes to myself about uh, some of the ones that I want to listen to and some of the folks that I want to I'm trying to plant the seed of having you back on, but also having one of these guests um, that yeah, I'm mentioning. Have you done panels before? Uh, yeah, I just uh, actually the day we're talking, which is going to be this episode will probably come out like a week or so later. Um, it's a it's a three person podcast. I actually have an eight one too. So I mean, it, it's I gotta get your vibe of how your personality is before I can just invite random people who have never met to talk to each other. But I mean, as long as you come to the table clean, much like me and you did in this conversation, I mean, this could have turned into like you just 
ask, wanting questions the whole time, but we kind of went off and had these talks and these deep things. And that's what the show's about. I mean, it's necessarily not really an interview, but it's, you know, how my mind thinks of things, how your mind thinks of things. And we just let it cook it up into a soup. And I appreciate the time you've given me for it, man. Um, is there a place where people can find you? And we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, RobertSiemens.com. Damn, just one drop. You don't have like Twitter or at Rob Siemens. Okay, fair. All right. Um, is there anything you want to say to anybody out there listening before we wrap up the show? Uh, nope. But Robbie, thank you so much. You've got a great name. Um, <laughs> one that I can appreciate. And so th thank you so much for inviting me to be on it. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.